Well, good morning, everyone. I'm going to start our lesson this morning with something that Jesus said in the book of Revelation. It's very strange that Jesus says anything in the book of Revelation, but in fact, he does. And he speaks directly to a church in Laodicea in Revelation chapter 3, beginning in verse 17. Jesus says, For you say, I am rich. I have prospered and I need nothing, not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire, so that you may be rich, and white garments so that you may clothe yourself and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen and salve to anoint your eyes, so that you may see. The church at Laodicea thought they were so well off. In fact, they thought they were rich. They thought they had need of nothing. And Jesus says to them, you need everything, because you are poor, and you are blind, and you are naked. As I think about that church, it's hard not to think about the United States of America. Because we are materially blessed in this country, are we not? We have been given so much. You have so many comforts available to you, whether you have a million dollars in the bank or a hundred dollars in the bank. We in this country have so much. And we have been blessed with prosperity. We've been blessed with peace. And oftentimes, I think, we look at times of poverty and times of tribulation and war as times of great trial and tr times of great difficulty. But I would assert that times of great prosperity and times of great peace are equally as dangerous for us. Because just as Jesus said to the church in Laodicea, you are too comfortable. And so what we're going to do this morning is we're going to go back to the book of Amos. In Amos chapter 6 and verse 1, God says to the people of Israel through Amos, Woe to those who are at ease in Zion, and to those who feel secure on the mountain of Samaria. The children of Israel had the same problem that the church at Laodicea had. And I am going to assert this morning they have the same problem that we struggle with today. And that is experiencing times of great prosperity. The, the nation of Israel, under the reign of Jeroboam II, had experienced great times of peace and prosperity. But the danger there was that they forgot about God, and they no longer cared about Him, going after other gods, following their own will. And God here says, Woe to you who are at ease. What I want to do this morning is I want to look through the book of Amos. We're going to do an overview, like a summary of the book of Amos, and we're going to go one by one and look at some of the dangerous problems that we see presented before us in the children of Israel. And what I want us to do this morning is not look at those terrible Israelites who couldn't follow God. What I want us to do this morning is to look at ourselves, to make the connection to ourselves and say, you know, I am prosperous and I am at peace. Do I struggle with the same things today? And so what we're going to do is we're going to look at the book of Amos. Amos is full of sermons, it's full of poems, it's full even of visions that Amos had. He was a shepherd, he was a fig tree farmer, and apparently he lived in Judah, but he was up in Israel preaching. And he had a message for the Israelites that is still applicable even today, because times of great prosperity and peace are still dangerous for us. And so let's begin our study here by breaking down Amos into its constituent parts. And if you look at the book of Amos, all nine chapters, and I'd encourage you to read these chapters on your own. It's a, it's a wonderful read. I mean, it's a terrible read, but it's a wonderful read. Amos is one of the funniest prophets. He's hilarious if you read through the book of Amos. He calls them cows, just straight up to their face. And all kinds of other things that he, that he talks about is just a, a great read. But if you break it down to its constituent parts, chapters 1 and 2 is God's, nation, or God's message to the nations and then specifically to Israel. And what you'll notice in the first and the second chapter is he begins laying out these condemnations against the nations. And as 
he names off nation one by one by one. You start to get this picture, if you were to put it on a map, that he's surrounding Israel and he's getting closer and closer to Israel. And then by halfway through the second chapter, he hones in on the, on the real target, which is Israel. And he accuses Israel for the rest of the book. And Israel is the main focus, but he does focus on these nations around, including Judah themselves. And the real problem of the nation of Israel, as we find, is that they were oppressing the poor. They were selling them into debt slavery. And in fact, they, they were not even allowing them representation. The poor were being oppressed by the, by the rich. The class divisions within Israel had become so great that the, that the poor were being mistreated almost being treated like animals by the rich. Now, if that doesn't sound familiar to you in the United States of America, I don't know what does. Because that is a great problem in our country today. And so let's begin here by looking at the first problem that we see here, and that is a vision problem. Times of great prosperity, times of great peace bring about a vision problem, and it Specifically, the Israelites were blind to the poor. Let's begin reading here in chapter 2, beginning in verse 6. Thus says the Lord, For three transgressions of Israel and for four I will not revoke the punishment, because they sell the righteous for silver and the needy for a pair of sandals. Those who trample the head of the poor into the dust of the earth and turn aside the way turn aside the way of the afflicted. Now we're going to stop right there. They were blind to the poor. They sold them for a pair of sandals. They didn't care about the poor. They didn't love the poor. And as we make the application of this into our own lives today, do you care about the poor? Generosity is such a, an integral part of the life of a Christian that in Acts chapter 2, when the church first began, what did they do almost immediately for each other? They began selling the things that they had, taking the proceeds and giving it to the poor that was among them to care for the needs of each other. I think too often times we fall into the trap of James chapter 2 in which we say, go in peace, be warmed and filled and do nothing. And as James there says, what good is that? We are rich. We have much. And are you using your riches? Are you using your prosperity and your peace to help those who are poor? And I think we do a good job of that here at this place, but we can do better. We can always do better. And so don't become blind to the poor. But also, the people were blind to God's involvement in the whole thing. Continue reading with me in chapter 2, verse 9. God, through the prophet, says, Yet it was I who destroyed the Amorite before them, whose height was like the height of the cedars, and who was as strong as the oaks. I destroyed his fruit above and his roots beneath. Also, it was I who brought you up out of the land of Egypt and fed you, or led you for forty years in the wilderness to possess the land of the Amorite. And I raised up some of your sons for prophets and some of your young men for Nazarites. Is it not indeed so, O people of Israel, declares the Lord? Israel had forgot that the reason why they were prosperous in the first place was because God had blessed them. God was the one behind it all. And for us today, do you remember that God is behind it all? Do you remember that God is the source of your prosperity? We may look to the government, we may look to the Federal Reserve, we may look to all the decisions happening in politics and say, that is the reason why we were prosperous. That is false. We are only prosperous, individually and collectively, because God has allowed that to happen. And if we cannot recognize that God has given us everything, then we will not be willing to give everything. Jesus says in Luke chapter 6 that... You need to be willing to give, and as you give, it will be given back to you by who? By God. Pressed down, shaken together, and pouring over. 
when we recognize that God is the source of our blessings, it is so easy to give because we know He will continue to give. As we give, He will give. But when we forget that, then we become blind to what God has really done and become self-sufficient and think, we have accomplished such great things. And as Jesus told the church in Laodicea, you think you're rich, but you're really poor and blind and naked. Buy from me gold that is refined. And that is what we need to do. We need to recognize that God and his son Jesus is the source of all of our blessings. Let's continue here. In Amos, in chapter 3, 3 through 6 is the next division. And it's God's message, particularly to Israel and also to its leaders. And here we see a great charge in chapter 3 and verse 2, where Amos says, You only have I known of all the families of the earth. Therefore, I will punish you for all your iniquities. God held them to a standard. He said, you alone have I known. You are special to me. And the fact that you've left me means I'm going to punish you so much greater than all of these other nations because you should have known better. It's one of the reasons why I believe that Jesus spent so much time rebuking the Pharisees. While he was gentle with the Gentiles, while he was gentle with those who were not of the religious elite, he laid into the Pharisees. And that is what God is saying through Amos here. There will be great consequences for your disobedience. And then he goes on to talk about their idolatry. The fact that they went off to serve other gods, man-made images and idols of all kinds. And the fact that God should not be worshipped that way. God must be sought with everything that we have in order to live. And then he goes on to talk about their hypocrisy. The hypocrisy of coming to the temple. The hypocrisy of coming to the offering and laying down your sacrifice while you treat the poor terribly. While you treat the poor with contempt. While you hate them. And he has a solution for that. And it's to focus on justice and righteousness. The people had forgotten about justice and righteousness. And their worship to God was completely insincere and completely hypocritical. And so that leads us to our second problem, which is a worship problem. Times of great peace and prosperity will bring us problems in our worship. And this is going to sound like I could have recorded this a few lessons ago and played it again, or we could have recorded it from one of Alan's lessons and played it again. But as, as we study through these minor prophets, time and time again, the problem is the same. And so we repeat the same thing over and over. And the prophets repeated the same thing over and over. And God repeated the same thing over and over. And the big problem in our worship is seeking neither God nor good. Let's look at chapter 5. Amos in chapter 5, verse 4. Three things that God says, and they're all very simple and straightforward. In verse 4, God says, For thus says the Lord of the house of Israel, Seek me and live. Verse 6, seek the Lord and live, lest he break out like fire in the house of Joseph, and it devour with none to quench it for Bethel. And then in verse 14, he says, seek good and not evil, that you may live. And so the Lord, the God of hosts, will be with you. Does that sound familiar? Does that sound at all like Matthew 6, 33? Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you? Have we forgotten that? Have we forgotten to seek God first? Do you put God at the top of your priority list? Or instead, do you put materialism at the top of your priority list? Because that is the problem of Israel. Israel put false gods, their own wealth, their own comfort, their own ease at the top of the priority list. And I think that manifests itself in our lives in a very many way. We can choose not to worship with the saints because of some comfortable activity that we'd rather be doing. We can choose not to study our Bibles so that we can sit on the couch and do nothing. In chapter 4, 
chapter 3, verse 12. Go back there. Thus says the Lord, As the shepherd rescues from the mouth of the lion two legs, or a piece of an ear, so shall the people of Israel who dwell in Samaria be rescued with the corner of a couch and a part of a bed. I said Amos was funny. This is funny. Just like somebody is trying to grab a, a lamb out of a lion's mouth, Israel is going to be rescued with a little piece of a couch left and a little piece of a bed left. They were so comfortable. They were such at ease. And God said, your rescue will, will come to nothing. You will not escape my punishment. Because they sought neither God nor good. But they were going through the motions. And again, I mean, we could easily have gone back to any previous lesson on the minor prophets to talk about this. But this is exactly the problem that they had in, in chapter 5, verse 21. I hate, I despise your feast. Can you see the, just the, the intensity of God's emotion there? I hate, I despise your feasts. And I take no delight in your solemn assemblies. Even though you offer me your burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. And the peace offerings of your fattened animals, I will not look upon them. Take away from me the noise of your songs. To the melody of your harps, I will not listen. And here's, here's the focus. Here's the remedy for this. But let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like ever-flowing streams children of Israel were going through the motions. And I don't think we need to stretch very far to make the application for ourselves today. Do we go through the motions in our worship to God? Because God is not a dumb idol. God is not an idol made with hands. Those idols were not capable of di distinguishing between a true worshiper and a false worshiper. But God knows everything that's going on in your heart, every thought, every intention. And He knows when you put on your suit and tie, when you put on that fancy dress, He knows whether you're doing it for the right reason or not. Keep that in mind. He knows when you're reading your Bible, if you're doing it so that you can grow and that you can help yourself spiritually, or He knows if you're trying to prove a point and make some make some justification of something that you believe. God knows. And will God accept your worship? Will God accept my worship? Does He look into my heart right now, and into your hearts right now, and see true, dedicated servants of His? Or instead, do the songs of our worship and the prayers that we offer fall on deaf ears by God and sound like noise, as He says here, in Amos 5. So times of peace and prosperity bring worship problems, and let's continue on here, co closing out this section in chapters 3 through 6. They, in fact, and this is amazing to me, they, in fact, thought they were so well off that they were ready for the day of the Lord. Bring on the day of the Lord. You ever heard anybody pray, Lord, come quickly? That's what they were saying. Lord, come, come quickly. Bring on the day of the Lord. Oh, they had no idea that 40 years later Assyria would trample them down and carry them away into captivity and that the day of the Lord for them would be terrible. And we'll talk about that more in just a second. Then in the last section in Amos, in chapters 7 through 9, Amos has a few visions, and they're really fascinating visions. But they're all dedicated to the idea of the day of the Lord. If you think you're ready for the day of the Lord, well, let me show you what I've seen. And those visions looked like swarms of locusts sweeping over the field and wiping out everything. The visions looked like scorching fire that just ripped through the entire nation and burned it to pieces. And it looked like overripe fruit. I love this picture. The vision of fruit. And you look at it, you're like, that, that looks delicious. I want some fruit. And you go to reach out for it, and it just melts away in your hand. And he has these visions. And these visions are for them to see that destruction is coming. God is coming to destroy the day you are looking so forward to, you arrogant Israelites. It's going to be terrible. And you have no idea. And so we see here not only a vision problem, and a worship problem, 
but we see a security problem. We're real focused on security here, aren't we? Not here, just in this place, but we're really focused on security in the United States of America. Look at what I have acquired. Look at what I have achieved. Look at all of the possessions that I own. And I am going to lock it up with 19 cameras and a security system, you know, system and all these other things. I'm going to hire someone to watch my house. I'm going to get a dog. And we, we're so focused on security. We want to feel secure. The children of Israel felt secure. And they were unafraid of the judgment. Let's look at Amos chapter 5, verse 18. And this is where God points the finger at them and their desire for the day of the Lord. He says, Woe to you who desire the day of the Lord. Why would you have the day of the Lord? It is darkness and not light. As if a man fled from a lion and a bear met him. You see that picture? I love that picture. Also, another hilarious picture. Guy, isn't it ironic? that this guy is running from a bear, and who does he meet? He meets a lion. Well, that's a bad day. Or, who went in, or he who went into a house and leaned his hand against a wall, so there he is, comfortable, and what happens? A serpent bites him. Is not the day of the Lord darkness and not light and gloom with no brightness in it? They were waiting for a day that they were so excited about, but they had no reason to be. And what it tells me is how much we can convince ourselves that we are okay when we are not. Jesus told the story. In, in the, the vision of what the judgment will look like, many, many will say on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And what will he say? Depart from me. I never knew. They had convinced themselves, religious people who had convinced themselves that they were okay and that they should stand the test of judgment, but they would not stand. And how about you? What do you convince yourself of? Here's my favorite thing to say at home. Ready for this? I don't know. You can ask Sherilyn. She asks me all kinds of questions as if, as if I'm Google. I have no idea why. <laughs> but my favorite thing to say at home, I love it. I say it all the time. I don't know. I don't know. And we need to be emotionally honest with ourselves in that way. To say, you know, I don't know. I don't know. But I know who does know. God knows. And we need to be aware about our situation to the point where we are willing to say, I do not feel confident yet that I have attained salvation. Now, yes, Paul was able to say, I am confident, and we should have confidence, but we always need to be looking at ourselves, examining ourselves in front of the mirror, saying, is there something I need to address? And if we pridefully and arrogantly stand and say, I'm, I, have, I have arrived, then we're going to run into the same problem that the Israelites did. And that happens in times of peace and prosperity because we don't feel like we need to look at ourselves very much, do we? And finally, the last thing that we see here is that their feasting is going to turn into fasting. Look with me in Amos chapter 8, beginning in verse 10. They were so comfortable and they were enjoying themselves quite a lot. But God says in verse 10 of chapter 8, I will turn your feasts into mourning and all your songs into lamentation. I will bring sackcloth on every waist and baldness on every head. Sorry, people, this, this is what God was going to do. Bring baldness on every head. I will make it like the morning for an only son, and the end of it like a bitter day. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord God, when I will send a famine on the land, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. They didn't care about God's word. And there was going to come a time when their feasting was turned into into bitter mourning, where all they were going to want is not food, is not comfort and pleasure. All they were going to want was God's word. Isn't that ironic? It reminds me of the story of Lazarus and the rich man. What did the rich man do when he was in torment after living a life totally, totally reprehensible to the, to the world and, and totally disregarding the poor? What does he say? 
when he's there in torment. All I want is to go and teach and tell my brothers of this place so that they will not end up here. You know what happens? He wanted to evangelize. Finally wanted to evangelize. Never wanted to before, but he wanted to after he was suffering great punishment for it. Every single one, to, one of us will want to evangelize someday if we wind up on the wrong side of judgment. Every single one of us will want to have done things differently, will regret the, the choices we made, the priorities we put in place. Every single one of us will regret all the feastings, all the comfort, all the pleasure, everything we will regret if we wind up on the wrong side of judgment. And if you don't do it now, you will be doing it for all eternity in a place that is much more painful than this. And so that was the message to Israel. He continues at the end of, of this really depressing series of chapters with one small glimmer of hope, and that was that the house of David was coming. Let's look in chapter 9, beginning in verse 11. In that day I will rise up the booth of David that is fallen and repair its breaches and raise up its ruins and rebuild it as in the days of old that they may possess the remnant of Edom and, note this, all the nations who are called by my name, declares the Lord who does this. He points to a day in which Jesus will come. He points to a day in which the kingdom will be established, and not just Israel, but all nations. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be able to enjoy the blessings of God's mercy. And that is the kingdom. That is the church. That is the church that was established by Jesus Christ. That is what you and I are here to participate in now. We are a part of this kingdom that he talks about here. And how awesome that is. That he talked about it all those many years ago. And now it's here. And you're a part of it. And so we need to understand in conclusion, in, in wrapping up all these things, that God is a God of justice and mercy. We've said this so many times. God is a God of justice. He punished those people for their sinfulness. For all of the problems that they had in their peace and their prosperity, he punished them and brought them into exile. But in the church, he presents to us his mercy, in which all of us, anyone who call on his name, can be saved. God is both just and merciful, and praise him for being such. And what we see to wrap up here is that true worship of God True and dedicated worship of God should always lead us to justice, righteousness, and loving our neighbors. Do not forget about loving our neighbors, because it is the second great commandment. And God will hold us accountable if we use our time of peace and prosperity selfishly, and we don't dedicate ourselves to serving others in those ways. Pick out your songbooks and turn to the number that's been announced. There is such great blessings in this country, but even more great blessings, far more great blessings, being a part of his church. We could live in squalor. We could be dirt poor, and we could have nothing. But if we were part of his church, we would have everything. And let's not forget that. Let's not elevate our country. Let's not elevate our possessions. Let's not elevate materialism to a point which we should not. Let's hold it in, in its proper place and put God first in all things, allowing Him to decide the direction for our lives rather than us deciding the direction for our lives. And if you're willing to let Him decide the direction for your life this morning, if you love Him, you recognize that He sent His only Son to die for you, and that you can be saved from your sins through repentance, washing away those sins in baptism, and continue a life of faithfulness, then we are ready to baptize you today. If you're a subject of the gospel call, please come as we stand and sing.